The year is 2006. It's a year that can only be described as a game changer in tech. From the unveiling of the first ever iPhone, to the horrors that are Facebook and Twitter being unleashed upon the world, much to the dismay of the, at the time, flourishing web of forums and personal blogs. At the same time, the gaming scene saw both the Wii and PlayStation 3 come out, one of which sold millions of units, while the other one still has no games. You might be surprised to hear that our chums at Valve Software were actually in a role at this point as well. With Half-Life 2 and its first episode expansions fresh in everyone's minds, and not to mention Steam's nearly meteoric rise the year prior, it was safe to assume that Valve was cooking up something big. And big it was, because after nearly eight years of broken promises, leaks, scraps, and reworks, the mysterious Team Fortress 2 would finally receive a proper trailer on July 19, 2006. With a unique art style that looked to be a 60s illustration come to life, many gamers from across the world were hyped for this brand new TF2. None more than Brent Copeland and Wes Wilson. The two met in 1985 during a Dungeons & Dragons session. Growing up to be lifelong friends, one of the many webs that connected the two was their shared love of Team Fortress. No, not Team Fortress Classic. Team Fortress, the mod for Quake. You know, it's the one where every time you jump, your character makes this grunting sound. It, it's too freaky for my tastes, but that's the best you had growing up in Huntsville, Alabama, a city known for, um, absolutely nothing whatsoever. The most interesting thing I found out about Huntsville is this. It's it's the world's saddest lion statue. Like why, why is he so miserable? And can that kid get off of him? I mean, he, he clearly isn't enjoying this interaction at all, but I'm getting sidetracked. While Brent and Wes liked Valve's Team Fortress classic, what they really looked forward to was Team Fortress 2. Fellow Huntsville residents, Eric Fullerton and Spencer Williams, weren't fans of Team Fortress beforehand, but after seeing that trailer pop up and hearing Brent and Wes talk about it, they gained an excitement for it as well, like some sort of TF2 cooties, if, if you want to put it that way. 2006 also marked the year that the channel slash company known as the Dead Workers Party would be formed by J.D. Frey, Willem Box, as well as the aforementioned Eric Fullerton and Brent Copeland. The Dead Workers Party came at a time when internet entertainment was just beginning to be considered an actual lucrative pastime, with YouTube only being a year old at the time. The original plan for the DWP was to produce movies and video, such as Attention Deficit Theater, which was a live stage performance with a mix of video skits. They also recorded the behind the scenes for a local Huntsville film, 20 years after, which is an interesting movie. That's kind of creepy. Creepy? Oh, no, I just... I've never seen a pregnant woman before, let alone felt a baby kicking inside her. Oh. I think Huntsville, Alabama should stick to sad line statues. Thank you very much. The slow shift toward internet entertainment was something that the Dead Workers Party could clearly see. In the summer of 2006, the DWP would start to expand their online presence, with the creation of their YouTube channel as well as starting a World of Warcraft podcast called World of WoW. Keep in mind, podcasts were an incredibly novel thing at the time. This was before your Joe Rogan and Is Fortnite Overrated roundtable. A podcast was something new and exciting, something to listen to on your iPod. So it's not a surprise that the niche of video game podcasting was pretty much in its infancy. During this time, video game podcasts were either news-oriented or focused on games with a lot of mechanical debt and social elements such as MMORPGs. So here's where it all gets interesting. Team Fortress 2 would release October 10th, 2007 on Valve's Orange Box. And needless to say, Brent, Eric, Wes, and Spencer were all hooked. Despite the fact that the Orange Box had a continuation of the greatest game ever made on it, and also the greatest puzzle game ever, it just didn't matter to them because all their free time was being chewed up by the now iconic 
class based shooter. The graphics, the tight gameplay, the sheer simplicity of just getting in there and fragga lagging as if there's no tomorrow. Plus also, um, Demo Knight and Mini Sentries didn't exist yet, so it was probably fun too. So now, hot off the success of their previous podcasting work, as well as their collective honeymoon love towards Team Fortress 2, talks about a TF2 podcast would start earlier than anyone really expected. Only around a week after TF2's release would these four officially meet in the same room. Workshopping their idea for a TF2 podcast went relatively smoothly as they were pretty much on the same page about everything, eventually landing on the name Control Point. The decision to host it under the DWP umbrella was a no-brainer as things quickly fell into place. So finally comes October 30th, only two and a half weeks after Team Fortress 2's release. The following sound reverberated across the fledgling TF2 space. Prepare to attack the enemy's control points. Get behind me, Doctor! I am fully charged! <laughs> you are listening to Control Point, a Team Fortress 2 podcast, with Brent Copeland, Eric Fullerton, Wes Wilson, and Spencer Williams. Control Point, Episode 1, recorded on October 30th, 2007. I'm Brent Copeland. I'm Eric Fullerton. I'm Wes Wilson. I'm Spencer Williams. And welcome to the show. This is the con- or this is Control Point, which is a Team Fortress 2 podcast. The very first one of its kind. <laughs> is that true? Uh, of our kind. This is the first one that we've ever done. <laughs> The first ever Team Fortress 2 podcast was here. You wouldn't be faulted too much for thinking that this isn't really a big deal. I mean, everyone's started a podcast and then quit after two to three episodes. And I mean, just look at TF Talk. <clears throat> there was one chick who was older than me that I was like flirty with, you know, mm-hmm. but I never like sent a dick pic or nothing to her or nothing crazy like that. Mm-hmm. Like that was it. What, you know, just because I'm a creator, I can't, like, flirt with somebody? You know, what's going on? Yeah, you know? no, it's that's just that's... stupid. And now it's time to stop looking at TF Talk. But this really wasn't your average podcast at all. There was an immediate passion to be felt from it instantly. Great mic quality for the time, organized and fruitful conversations with, more importantly, funny moments stemming from them at every turn. So was it really a surprise that the podcast was pretty much an immediate hit back in 2007? It was the first TF2 podcast coming out before any sort of content creation boom would happen for the game. Hell, it came out months before a TF2 community would even exist. So if you wanted to watch something TF2 related on the internet, you would inevitably find Control Point. In spite of being recorded in Eric's bedroom, the first few episodes of Control Point really left an impression on the community. The hosts were by no means experts on the game, but at that point no one was. And that wasn't really the point anyway. Talking about number crunching or hyper competitive strategies was something that the Control Point crew outright avoided. And they never got stuck on things like obsessive fact checking or anything like that, which might seem like a bad thing until you realize that it makes listening to the episodes, especially now, a lot more entertaining. Brent, Eric, Wes, and Spencer often found themselves sharing their own gameplay experiences and anecdotes as well as information they had learned from some secondhand source. This made for a very entertaining listening experience, as the hosts often butted heads, bounced off each other, and generally just had a great time talking amongst themselves. Despite the overall professionalism of their production, even in the early episodes, Control Point's bread and butter was in its silly, laid-back attitude, mixed in with their nuggets of wisdom for the TF2 community. At the same time, the newly formed Control Point group had a real knack for sparking an immediate sense of community. A Steam group for the podcast would be created right after the release of the first two episodes, resulting in a wave of camaraderie-hungry people to join pretty much immediately. They would actually use the Steam group, by the way. They'd do things like announce play sessions and make other important announcements, making this perhaps the only instance in the history of the universe where a Steam group actually had a purpose other than hosting suspicious giveaways. So by the time of the third episode's release, they would already open a quote-unquote private 20-player server, sharing the password with anyone part of the newly formed Control Point community. It wouldn't stop there, as thanks to being a part of the larger Dead Workers Party umbrella, It allowed Control Point to have its own website, but more importantly, 
its own forum. On this forum, there would be daily discussions between Control Point regulars about TF2, the podcast itself, or anything else they found interesting at the time as a community. The word community here is interesting in and of itself, as TF2, and by extension Control Point, came at a time when clan culture was making an exit from the gaming scene. What were once called clans were now dubbed communities, as Wes Wilson would point out in an early episode. Let y'all give shout outs to your, your clan mates. And uh, <laughs> I say that because now it's, it's changed, right? It's not clan mates anymore. What is it now? It's, uh, it's community friends. Yeah. We're community group. members. Yeah. Yeah, and, We're community uh, members with one another. Almost everything had pretty much fallen into place at this point as they began to post and then later livestream their episodes. Control Point's first order of business was to talk about all of TF2's classes and their, at the time, fresh thoughts on them, as well as other things happening within TF2 and its newly forming community. With the show slowly taking shape, their recurring segments such as introducing their topics via a briefcase, as well as taking listener contributions, aka reading emails sent to them by the newly forming Control Point fanbase. They also had a phone number which allowed listeners to send their own voicemails to be played on the show to varying but funny degrees of success. And we got one more uh, call in from uh, Sunny Kim, I think. Uh, here's, here's that one. Uh, this is uh, Sunny Kim. Uh, I play TF2. I heard your podcast. You guys are pretty awesome. Uh, here's a tip for the scout for your podcast, double jumping. It is awesome. And let's see, another tip is for scouts, if you have a shotgun, the closer the range for your shotgun, the more powerful it is. The more powerful it is, yeah. And also there is, I know I'm leaving a lot of messages, but still, okay, bye. Yeah, that's awesome. But, uh, Thanks did, for you notice in. This, did you notice this? Do you notice this? Their episodes discussing the classes would take a brief pause at episode 10 when Christmas came around, with arguably one of their most long-standing contributions to the TF2 community. It's beginning to look a lot like Dust Bowl. Yeah, that's right, that song was from Control Point. Even past the fact that it swept the community at the time, the song is still super iconic to this day, with a recent animated version of it by Texlo reaching over 2 million views. Not only that, but a parody of the song that satirized TF2's modern bot-infested state would get over 400,000 views thanks to an animation of it by Emperor Faze, who would then go on to make Mimi Sentry made dress and accessories that the, the, this sucks i'm right, moving on they would do three separate christmas episodes and each time the gimmick would be that we would be just be treated to 20 to 30 minutes of high quality tf2 christmas parodies Everyone talks about the Dust Bowl song, but there are some real bangers in here. Builders League United Wonderland, Spy Sap in My Sandwich, I'm dreaming of a new update, and the cream of the crop, CP Jump the Shark, which was this eight minute clusterfuck, which, you know, they had the first two minutes of lyrics planned out, and then the rest was just really funny. <laughs> These songs were so plentiful that in the end they had enough to compile an entire album. And I bump this every day, alright? This shit was on my rap last year. If I had to put this on my Weezer tier list, this would be a low A for sure, and that is saying a lot. They're good songs, okay? I, I like... When, when else am I gonna get to talk about this? There was something about the podcast itself that drew people in pretty much instantly. It's really difficult to convince someone that a podcast is funny. Because I've often found that podcasts, contrary to brain rotten TF2 clip dumps, are really long. Of course, I can play funny clips, but it isn't really telling the whole story of how that funny moment got there. <laughs> Uh, when we were playing one of these big games, um, I think it was on that day. Dust Bowl, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually, was. it was okay. So on Dust Bowl, um, I hear Wes calling out in his microphone. <laughs> he's um, <clears throat> sounds to me like he's um, he's quite mad at, or something. Like he's he's calling this he's calling people a name that I can't really say. 
I mean, I can physically say it, but um, to <laughs> we're, keep trying, this, we're trying to stay keep this a, a somewhat PG rating or whatever. I'll say F nut. F nut. Um, F nut. But you can imagine what the F stands for. There's three missing letters there. <laughs> so I'm just like, hey, F nut, I'm cu- let's go around the corner. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, I'm right behind you, F nut. I'm like, oh my god, what is happening to Wes? You're like, all right, all right, I'm ready. You know, you know, <laughs> hit it, F nut. You know, it's like, all right, uh, Wes has lost it. I'm gonna have to get with him later and ask him what's going on here. So after n- not just that one match, but after a few matches of him just calling this guy F nut. Yeah, because I was like, at first I thought he was calling Spencer an F nut, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. But then I realized that you were calling. Not Spencer, but other people, and I was just like really confused. So, but I I realized you never called me an F nut. So I was like, well, <laughs> what <laughs> what constitutes being an F nut and not, you know? So it's like the new noob. <laughs> yeah, I want to be an F nut. <laughs> so at the end of the story, so basically, uh, three or four matches later, I'm just looking at the score, and it's one of those where it's sixteen on sixteen. So. You know, if you're not if you're not in the top what twelve twelve, yeah. You know, you're you're off the thing. So F nut was not on the thing. <laughs> so finally, um, he started getting more points, and I saw that his name was Lord F nut. Yeah, and I thought, wow. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, okay. we sort of get a mea culpa from from uh, from Eric over over the line. We hear, you know, Wes. I just thought you were going off, but uh, <laughs> no, actually calling a guy by his name. So yeah. Uh, so. It kind of made me feel better knowing that you weren't on the other end, just insanely, insane with rage. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, I'm a smoldering medic. Yeah. (laughs) This, in my opinion, hilarious F-nut joke has like four minutes of prelude that I just can't show you here for the sake of time. So you will have to trust me when I call these guys funny because I am the YouTuber here and thus I hold all the power. The Control Point Podcast thrives as a piece of radio because of the host's energy. Each topic, each talking point, even down to the tangent is carried with this contagious enthusiasm that even a simple story like this one can just land so well. It's really intoxicating listening to these one to two hour long doses of pure excitement for the game. From marveling at 24-7 two-fort servers to reminiscing about some dumb chat interaction they had, it just creates this real bond with you as the listener with the podcast itself. Not in a parasocial Minecraft YouTuber get groomed kind of way, but in more of a wow, I can picture myself being in these scenarios. Wow, I really want to play TF2 now. I wish that game was still around. While we're still in 2008, I really want to talk about Uber Control. So for April Fools, the Control Point guys made a fake server hosting website called Uber Servers, which among many benefits hosted quantum ping technology. The best part was that that week's episode was fully about Uber control because the show got bought out to hilarious results. Are you tired of getting your face pwned because of high pings? Crit Rockets got you down? Lamer's ruining all your fun? has the most Uber servers around, featuring all of your favorite games, including Team Fortress 2, Unreal Tournament 3, Duke Nukem Forever, and Barbie Horse Adventures. Don't worry about your ping, because our super fat pipes carry the action directly into your brain. Subscribers to UberServers.com. Uber Gamer Service receive the ability to rage kick anyone from the server. Even if you're getting served, you'll always have the last laugh with ra- 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 rage, kick. rage Kick. And that's not all. Gold subscribers can rage ban. Rage ban. Not enough revenge for you? Platinum subscribers can call in the exclusive UberServers.com Paramilitary Strike Force. Strike 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 Force. They'll go to your opponent's house and subscribe today and get a free lifetime supply of Uber Aid. Uber Aid. Our energy drink is so explosive it will blow your head off. Certain restrictions apply. Offer not available in the United States or anywhere outside the United States. Every person that I've talked to that was there for Uber Control say that it's the funniest thing ever, and honestly, I can see it. And while every episode had the hosts carrying most of it, the community would slowly start getting involved to the point that they felt like they were uh, as much of a part of the show as the hosts were. Eifrit's question of the week was one of many of these sections, which 
honestly shout out to him because he provided a lot of pictures that I used in this video. Like, if it wasn't for him, when talking about Uber servers, instead of using this, I, we would have had to use this. So, huge shout out to him. There was a rapid fire question segment hosted by a large number of Control Point forum users. But my favorite section was State of the Server with Johnny Napalm, which had the, at the time, server admin Johnny Napalm just report on what changes he made to the server that week. And it's hosted in this sort of way where it's like all cutesy, like he's reporting from within the TF2 server. I just, I, I just really like it. I just think it's a cool idea. It's these small regular appearances as well as the actual neat discussions that kept people coming back. There was almost a culture centered around inside jokes because, you know, you, you gotta, gotta be in the know to know, you know? No. And that's why you've never heard of them. That's not to say that the podcast was uninviting at all. Heck, the entire community itself was known at the time to be one of the more inviting and friendly places in the TF2 community, period. The game itself was known for incredibly toxic lobbies. Like, if you thought some of today's interactions are bad, you haven't seen anything yet. From mic spam, saucy sprays, to an erroneous usage of slurs, your average TF2 game was best experienced with the voice chat off. The CP servers, on the other hand, were known for very active moderation and banned anyone who tried to pull that stuff there. Gaining a genuine reputation for being a positive environment, this extended to the forums, team group, and the show itself, of course. The most fun example of this communal feeling was an event dubbed CP After Dark, where on weekends, a bunch of people including the hosts would just get on TF2 to play all night while getting absolutely hammered in the process. They'd play on silly maps like Cyberpunk, CP Falling, DM Duel, etc, etc, while running all talk and sometimes even zero gravity and no clip and whatever else they could come up with. Something very insane to me was that this community of people was so committed that they ended up having a convention. That's right, CPCon set sail one April weekend in 2009. A bunch of Control Point community regulars showed up to meet each other IRL for the first time ever in Birmingham. No, not in the that is England Birmingham, but rather the futuristic utopia that is Birmingham, what? Alabama. CPCon was a weekend full of Guitar Hero, heavy drinking, and a live recorded episode of Control Point. It's actually insane to me listening to a full crowd of people gather around to listen to a Team Fortress. Fortress 2 podcast, but that's just the kind of effect that Brent, Eric, Spencer, and Wes had on people. So it's really no surprise that there was a sudden follow-up called CPCon Jr. in their hometown of Huntsville only a couple months later. Okay, I hear you, Indy. These guys had a good podcast and they had fans and blah blah blah. Do you have anything more spicy for me? Well, how about the fact that Valve was listening to the Control Point podcast? Not only was there someone at Valve who listened to Control Point, that someone was Robin Walker, aka the guy who like made Team Fortress, the guy who was instrumental to TF2 even existing, much less being good. Yeah, him. Robin would occasionally respond to the host's emails, but more importantly, on September 16th, 2009, he would shout out the podcast on a blog post. The guys were ecstatic about this, immediately naming the next episode, Valve is Listening, and then Eric Fullerton would go on to write a song called Valve is Listening, which ended up being kind of beautiful, man. Sh shit, I don't know. If you needed further convincing that Valve loved these guys, Something they used to do when they were like a, you know, actual video game company was give community grade items to people who they thought made a significant contribution to the TF2 community. So all four hosts got an item sent their way and they were all weapons for their most played classes. Going back to music, the Control Point community would end up being a very musical group, as the hosts would play other people's song parodies during the show. These obviously varied in quality, but there's a certain charm to them that really makes them cool to listen to. These song creators have become pretty prolific in the TF2 community, with some, like Freaky Delic, making a CP community tribute, which is a little bittersweet when you watch it now. 
You can't forget about the podcast. Eric, Bren, Wes, and Spencer shout at full blast. Speaking out their minds with their big old microphone. Sounding like their brains came out of the Twilight Zone. Hundred people live just sitting and waiting. Fuller just to shout, just anticipating. Podcast record. Chat goes nuts, even though most leave because they see it sucks. So take this little song as an invitation. Join the community, it's like a vacation. Evans are all nice and they're all so funny. And I'm really am surprised they aren't paid money. And I'm afraid I have to go, man. Don't be sad. When you see me on the servers, you'll be very glad. This song wasn't made to insult, it made to teach. That's it, I'm done, no more. Now, hey. other prolific song creators were Ash Williams, Captain Spaulding, and perhaps most popular, I Drink Your Milkshake. Milkshake was, for lack of a better description, just a kid, and he used to send a lot of gameplay tips to the hosts, and perhaps most importantly, a lot of parody songs. So much so that in the end they would just have an entire segment in the show called Milkshake Tunes where they would play the next Milkshake tune and they were kinda cool. <laughs> Don't wanna be a TF2 idiot. My pyro started the fire. That's why it's burning and points of the pyro is earning. Shot your player in the air and made me flee. Five rounds since you built that century. Hello, medics, my old friend. Hey there, Control Point. What's it like running a podcast? The Control Point podcast had a set in stone no swearing policy which might seem incredibly silly now, but with just how toxic the internet used to be back in the late 2000s, this genuinely helped make Control Point the most friendly corner in TF2 at the time. There's a stigma nowadays with things that are outwardly family friendly, but Control Point's different. It's further proof that you don't gotta be a potty mouth on the internet to be funny. There's something I've been avoiding thus far though, and it's episode 50. During Control Point's original run, one week it was episode 49, and the next, it was 51. This led to a lot of confusion on the forums. At first, people thought it was a simple labeling error, but as the host continually ignored and shunned any mentions of episode 50, people started to grow increasingly suspicious. Only on episode 71, around four months later, would the hosts announce that the script for episode 50 was put up for auction, and it would end up being won by a familiar face. We, uh, we put episode 50 on eBay, and um, we told everybody about it. We printed it out. We said, we're only going to sell one copy of this. We're not going to have any downloads or anything. You just, we, we printed it, and whoever gets it, gets it. And we'll all sign the, the cover of it. But we're never going to have it available any other way. So it just kept getting bid up and bid up. And he was the one who, who won. It was a uh, drink your milkshake. And it was over $100. And he was a kid, too. I couldn't believe it. I kind of didn't want to sell it to him. I'm like, oh, let's just give it to him. But... You know, he really loved it, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> Soon after, episode 50 would be released publicly for everyone to see, and it was unique. Instead of being an episode about Junction or something, it was actually an epic, globe-trotting, time-traveling radio drama, and the community loved it. Some of my favorite moments included Taxi Driver is Easy, The People of the Briefcase, and all the really catchy songs. It was a really well-made piece of radio. Like, for instance, when they're in the airport, there's sound effects, and it's so well put together that you can really close your eyes and just imagine the scene happening. But, uh, admittedly, it kind of had nothing to do with TF2 by the end of it. After the fanfare of episode 50 subsided, Control Point continued to chug along. As fun as it was, nearing the end of 2009, Brent, Eric, Wes, and Spencer had decided that Control Point should end with a bang. Rather than letting the podcast fade out unceremoniously, as podcasts often do, the hosts had decided to put their everything into CP100, intending it to be the finale. As episode 100 started production in late 2009, the Control Point community wasn't aware of the fact that it would be their last. The 100th episode was announced to be screened early for all of those that attended that year's CPCon. And I'll just let Eric explain how that went. I believe it was days before 100 was released. We had CPCon and people came in and we, we told everybody that you're going to be able to hear 100 before everybody else because we're all going to sit in a room and we're just going to play it on the loudspeakers and we're all just going to sit and laugh and just enjoy it. And everybody's like, yes, yes, that's what I want to do. 
And it was so weird now thinking we all just sat around listening to an audio podcast with nothing to look at, but it <laughs> time flew and everybody really loved it. I mean, anyway, that's what we did. And then at the end, people were tearing up because they didn't know and we didn't tell anybody. So we literally got to see the looks on their faces. And it was just like, made me tear up just looking at them. I'm like, that's, people this is what's crying. happening. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, yep, this is what's happening. They're like, I can't believe it. Like, I literally can't believe it. And I'm like, I can't either, but this is what's happening, you know? After the absolute roller coaster that was Control Point's 100th episode, the crew had decided that the podcast had reached its ultimate conclusion. The forums stayed up, the servers chugged along, but the show that bound them all together was missing. The hosts wanted to do a new podcast, a general video gaming pod that allowed them to talk about any game they wanted, calling it Nation of Gamers. The TF2 dev team was saddened by their departure as well, as they'd go on to send the hosts a bunch of TF2 merch, as well as a personalized letter from Saxton Hale himself. I mean, wow, if you get Valve to send a letter by Saxton Hale telling you that you've done a good job, then you had to have done something special. The hosts of Control Point moved on to their next project as the rest of 2011 chugged along for Team Fortress 2's wider community. Valve released some major updates, the Steam Workshop was finalized for TF2, and a competitor podcast, Critscast, was reigning supreme after Control Point's exit from the stage. So much so that in June of 2011, Valve had decided to award the famed Lo-Fi Longwave hat to the Critscast crew, which, which uh, I don't mean to brag, but I got one, so you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. As for our hosts, Brent, Eric, Wes, and Spencer, their Nation of Gamers podcast would reach a respectable 33 episodes over about a year-long runtime. But wait, why did it stop? Since it wasn't a niche thing, and there was already a million, IGN had like a thousand podcasts, I think, at the time. But there was so many multi-game variety type podcasts at the time. We were just lost in the sea. Uh, the only our only um, listeners were just, you know, CP, you know, control point listeners and people that knew us and stuff like that. So, uh, and even that was dwindling because they were really there for TF2. We burned out um, and I think we just needed a break. We needed to like focus on another niche that really got us going, something really exciting like TF2, you know, and, and nobody really cared that much about all these broad topic ones and i think at the point when we realized that we're like yeah okay let let's let's regroup guys let's regroup let's turn them all off and let's just regroup and that's what we did <laughs> so it was finally time to come back to control point with the release of their 100th and first episode control point revival and so it was all back on with their relatively new server hoster in the form of lowpings.net who simply let them host their servers for free in exchange for being shotted out on the podcast. Control Point's community went on as if the year-long drought never even happened. The show was back, more cool discussions and the same lovable hosts. 105 would mark another episode recorded live in front of an audience when Control Point attended PlayOnCon 2011. The show would get a new recurring section that focused on listeners proposing new weapons for the game called What's in the Crate? Which became a huge meme in the community after forum user WKW would send in his suggestion for the bumper for this brand new section. Now I haven't been mentioning this much, but a beloved bit of the podcast was custom bumpers. Now these were either made by the hosts themselves or passionate listeners and these got pretty elaborate. I'll play a couple examples right now. When he asks, they answer. It's Ifrit's question of the week. Peekaboo! That's dirty. Coming up at the speed of sound, it's the quick fire question round. Think fast, chuckle nuts. Look at me! Presenting Player of the Week. Now I am King of Team! <laughs> Player of the Week. Always rules, man. You can't go wrong with the heavy, ever. Totally. Now, having heard all this, you might think that WKW's bumper would be something elaborate or a jingle or something with a voice filter on it. Well, here it is, I'll just play it. What's in the crate? I'll play it again. What's in the crate? I'll play it a couple what, more times. What? Yep, yep, that's it. That's all it was. And this ended up being so funny that it was the final big inside joke of the podcast as it ended 22 episodes. 
after the revival. This is very sudden, as there was pretty much zero indication that episode 122 would be their last. People were wondering if whether they were taking a small break, or whether they were coming back at all. A big red flag was that in that year, 2011, they wouldn't return for a Christmas episode. These were usually landmarks within the community. They were things that everyone was looking forward to, because there was going to be so many new, funny carols to listen to. But come Christmas Eve of 2011 and nothing. People started to drift away because, yeah, it seemed that episode 122 would be their last. Or would it? Because around a month after episode 122 came episode 123, and finally, Control Point is back, and why is it seven minutes long? Well, it turned out that Brent really wanted Control Point to continue, but being by himself, he basically spent the seven minute runtime speeding through the segments, making awkward jokes and reading some listener contributions, and it's just kind of sad. It's such an awkward viewing experience seeing Brent, an otherwise funny and entertaining guy, having nobody to bounce off of while he just sits in a room by himself. This sentiment was echoed by the comment section, with most hoping that this is a one-off thing and that the regular old Control Point episodes would return soon. And well, they were right about this being a one-off thing at least, as after this, Control Point just ended. There was no giant finale, there was no gracious send-off, it basically just faded away with a whimper. The TF2 server slowly dropped in player numbers and shut down as even the forums and the Steam group faded away into obscurity. The last ever match on a control point server, the last forum post, the last ever voicemail sent to be played on the show, as it all faded away into obscurity, there was no one left to ask why. So. Control Point might have disappeared, but Team Fortress 2 stays eternal. From 2012 to present day, aka 12 years later, TF2 has had 25 major updates from iconic game changers like Man vs. Machine to near game-ruining meltdowns that were Invasion and especially Meet Your Match. Well, you know all this bot crisis update drought stuff that you're sick of hearing about? Well, the era we're in right now only makes up around 40% of the time since Control Point's disappearance. All of this to say that it's been a darn long time since January of 2012. Things changed a lot after this. Spencer Williams would largely disappear from the internet altogether, at least publicly, as it seems that those kind of days were behind him. Regrettably, Brent, Eric, and Wes would later on give up their long-standing dream of trying to make a career out of the Dead Workers Party, as numbers on the channel started to dwindle. At the same time, the DWP would disband altogether. Wes Wilson would turn his attention to live streaming, garnering a loyal audience on Twitch where he now does his weekly streams. Brent Copeland, after a couple more short-lived podcasts, would largely retire from online creation. And finally, Eric Fullerton would go back into the entertainment world as he now edits music videos, works with others in the industry, and uses his years of experience to help produce professional podcasts. Eventually, a lot of them started talking to each other a whole lot less than they used to. So now we're in the present day, and here's where I come in. For some context, late last year I moved away from my hometown for college, and it was a pretty drastic change going from a full house full of people to a small apartment by myself. And I didn't know many basic skills like cooking, but you know, learning all that wasn't really the hardest part. The actual hardest part was the sheer amount of boredom I experienced whenever I was not on campus. With my computer back home, all I could realistically do was browse the web to pass the time, and browse I did. To get my TF2 fix, I would just continually search up Team Fortress 2 on Google, trying to find anything new, like an addict. As you can already tell, I was hooked. Whether I was commuting to campus, buying groceries, or just sitting alone at home, Control Point was right there with me, blasting through my Chinese earbuds. The hardest part of living alone was just how quiet everything gets. I mean, you could put on music, but it just gets grating after a while, and even stupid, really long video essays about something you don't care about can really become mind-numbing after a little bit, go figure. But whenever I would put on Control Point, my apartment would liven up instantly, and I could go about my day while listening to the guys discuss whatever they were discussing. I've already talked about at length how entertaining the show is, but I can't stress enough how 
during that transitory period in my life, just listening to the four guys talk about TF2 really helped. Now, I know some of you have been thinking this whole time, why would I listen to a podcast that's 15 years out of date? Won't everything in it be wrong? Well, first of all, TF2 hasn't changed substantially in the last eight years, and also, wouldn't you rather be listening to something like the 2009 idling scandal and everyone's reaction to it, rather than your 10,000 Bad Weapon Academy. Plus, they're really funny, well-put-together shows, and no amount of updates could change that. Either way, I had something to look forward to in my daily routine, listening to episodes every single day until I downloaded 122, listened to it, tried to look for the next one, and it just wasn't there. So now I really wanted to know what happened, and it ultimately led me to the decision of making this documentary in the first place, with my obvious first step being to contact the hosts. Now admittedly, my first way of contact can only be described as incredibly moronic. I found their LinkedIn's, then I had to make a LinkedIn account, which was a long, arduous, Herculean task. And then once I finally made it and tried to message them, it wouldn't let me. Thank you, actual worst social media ever. Then finally, the two neurons in my brain decided to fire off as I realized that they must have public Twitter accounts. So after reaching out to them there, I was genuinely surprised to be met with nothing but real enthusiasm. I ended up directly reaching out to Eric Fullerton, Wes Wilson, and Brent Copeland. And later on, I also managed to reach out to the remaining host, Spencer Williams, who graciously allowed me to make this documentary in the first place, but wished not to get involved, which is fair enough. I ended up having private conversations with all three of the other hosts, and one of my conversations with Brent Copeland kind of changed my life. Look, I don't want to get too personal here, but... I had been struggling with my mental health for a pretty long time. It feels like my brain is fighting me at every turn, like whenever I try to do basic tasks, my brain is just shrouded in this Herobrine type 2 chunk fog. For a while, I had suspected that I had ADHD, but my thought process always boiled down to, eh, I don't want to check, I'm probably just stupid, who cares. That was until I had my first conversation with Brent. Obviously, we talked about TF2 and Control Point, but eventually I started making fun of him for doing a Trove Let's Play back in the day. And then he started playing Weezer on his guitar, and eventually he started talking about his ADHD, and Brent briefly talked about how getting a diagnosis and proper medicine for his ADHD really helped him in the long run, and then I responded with my usual, I might have it, but I don't really know, I don't really care, etc, etc. And then he just said, it'll change your life. And eventually we moved on from that topic and talked about something else and then hung up and went our separate way. Those words, that single sentence kept ringing in my ear for months on end until eventually I decided to get tested for ADHD and it turns out that I do have it. And it explained a lot, like for instance, my rancid upload schedule. Since then, I felt more confident, more forgiving towards myself, and it was really the final push I needed to get this video done. And none of it would have happened without Brent's words. Control Point Podcast, and more importantly, the people behind it have changed my life for the better. After speaking to the hosts, Eric and Brent helped me attempt to reach out to any former community regulars by making a Twitter post and echoing the iconic Steam group. Before I knew it, I had former Control Point regulars sharing their amazing memories with me. The first episode or two I listened to would have been like December 2007. And, um, you know, things were kind of just like normal kid stuff then. But by like late December, my legs started turning into jelly in like a medical sense. <laughs> and uh, as a couple weeks went on, like, it was getting really hard to walk, and I just had no idea what was going on. So my parents took me to the hospital, um, and I was, like, not concerned that my body was failing me. I was more concerned, I'm not going to be able to play Team Fortress 2. So I uh, loaded my iPod Nano up with episodes of Control Point, and um, that's what I was listening to basically 24-7 while I was in the hospital. With uh, I'm fine now. Uh, it completely recovered, but... It's a scary episode, and it was nice to be able to uh, just listen to 
the lads talk about spy crabs and, and all that stuff while well, laid up in a hospital bed. So yeah, th th those guys hold a special place in my heart for that reason. Control Point was TF2 for me. It was probably, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively minor part of TF2 culture, but it, it felt like everything. I absolutely loved it. I probably had every single episode on my iPod, so I could just listen to them whenever. Having Control Point, when I was at that very formative age, and having all these adults around me that were very positive people uh, was pretty instrumental. And I think back on it fondly all the time. I miss it big time. And I think it's very cool that we're kind of getting to relive some of the nostalgia of it right now uh, through, through your documentary, but also through the Discord server. And like, hopefully we'll be able to set up a, a little TF2 night together and, and maybe I'll get to experience that CP After Dark with drinking for the first time in my life. It'll be fun. So the the time they spent organizing a lot of the stuff and writing and singing and having events and and they were still so giving of their time and so friendly and so uh, nice to be around, which is why the memories are still so awesome and so strong. When Control Point was active, you know, I'm in my mid 20s. So during the show, plenty of free time. It's 2023, I'm 11 years sober, I am married, I have two kids, and there's one on the way. So to say I, uh, I'm i busy now is an understatement. You know, I'm a fucking grown ass man now who hurts when I bend over and pick up one of my kids. It's better, it's different, um, but that's just life, you know? It was so much fun. It was the, you know, for, for that time in my life and that community, like it's, I don't think I'll ever have a big, online gaming community that I've been a part of. Like that's, that's probably it, you know, for me. It felt so casual. It felt like a group of, a big group of friends, you know. Brent, Eric and Spencer were probably the three funniest people I knew. I'm glad it happened. It was a shame when it was over. It means a good bit. I mean, it really did so much to formulate who I am as a person right now because it did so much to formulate who I was as a kid. Control Point was fun. It was insightful. It invited a community to form around it that fed into the fun of the game. I, yeah, I miss that show. It all comes back to that podcast. Even though Control Point faded away over 12 years ago, it seems that the impact it has left on all its former members will last a lifetime. And this is none more apparent than with the hosts themselves. Hi, uh, my name is Wes Wilson. I am one of the members of the former Dead Workers Party podcast group. I'm uh, Brent Chaos Copeland, uh, one of the hosts of the Control Point podcast. Hey, I'm Eric Fullerton. I hosted and produced the Control Point podcast back in 2007. You know, it was something unexpected. When you're in the moment, it's, you don't probably appreciate it as much as later on, but it was just, it was just amazing. The community was unbelievable. Like I, I, that was one of the best parts. And I still have friends from that community to this day. There are people I talk to regularly who I met because they were part of the control point community. Getting to um, meet, uh, work with people like Eric and, and Wes and Spencer uh, for such a long time and getting to know people, them getting to know you, um, it's, it's almost like a marriage and you go through things and you learn so much about yourself, um, good and bad. Uh, that I feel like it's changed me for the better. So it's, it's, it's definitely been life changing. And, um, it was, um, one of the best times in my life, actually. For all former control point listeners, do you have a final message to beam? Oh, that's a tough one. I, I, I am just happy that you got to participate in something that I still value to this day as a, as an amazing experience. And I know the people who were involved. There's, there are people who still have control point in their steam tags because of how valuable that experience was to them. And I'm glad 
if there is anything that makes me that that makes me shine inside is that there were people who got to participate with things that I was involved in that they still value. And thank you. And I'm glad we got to do this. And I, I hope you're creating and doing crazy things like those that inspired you back in the day. Uh, your whole time with Control Point. Uh, one, one word that would best describe it. Train wreck. Brent Copeland, Eric Fullerton, Wes Wilson, and Spencer Williams are creatives at heart. When you're a creative at heart, you're always gonna keep making things and innovating. Something that's really cool about the Dead Workers Party is that they did a lot of things before they were cool. Video game podcasting was one thing they were trendsetters in for sure, but have you even heard of their massive impact on the neighboring Minecraft community? In late 2010, Eric Fullerton would release one of the first ever Minecraft songs slash music videos. It was called In Search of Diamonds, you might have heard of it. Not only did this song go viral, you know who cites it as a massive inspiration? The Captain Sparkles. The fucking creeper old man guy. The Dead Workers Party also made a song called We Built This Town, which starred the Minecraft chick, who you may know as the person who hosts those Minecraft lives where they announce like two new blocks or something. I don't keep up anymore. Brent and Eric were even a part of the Yogg's cast for a little bit, and they had those goofy avatars that I, I just can't stand looking at them. Can we get them off the screen, please? From World of Warcraft and Star Wars The Old Republic to Minecraft and Team Fortress 2, these guys have touched many circles of the internet with their work, spreading love and community wherever they may be. Their Minecraft endeavors, such as their music videos, their server, and even their Minecraft podcast, The Shaft, were miles more popular than Control Point ever was. And yet, the Control Point community was the most loyal and tight-knit space they ever had on the internet. I think Control Point speaks to how big the TF2 community really is. I mean, there was this whole group of people that was big back in the day and they did a lot of stuff and nowadays barely anyone remembers them. So I think the TF2 community is sort of like the ship of Theseus, bear with me here. It was this legend about this boat and as pieces of it started to decay and fade away, it got replaced by brand new pieces and eventually all the pieces were replacement pieces, begging the question of whether or not it's still the same boat. The TF2 community feels much in the same way to me. I mean, it's been 15 years and besides a couple old farts, I mean veterans, the fledgling community of TF2's early years has been completely replaced by the one we have now, which has unfortunately left any memory of control point in obscurity. I definitely think it's still worth checking out today. From their April Fool's episodes, the Christmas specials, and especially episode 50 and 100, even just the regular episodes, it's probably the most fun TF2 thing you can listen to right now. The fourth host, Spencer, has graciously given me a note to read out as well. I've been asked to say a few words about Control Point, and it's hard to sum up all my feelings in just a few words. This show meant a lot to me. Thanks to Wes, Eric, and Brent for letting me come along on such a cool journey, and thanks to all the listeners who made the whole thing worth it. Seriously, without all of you, I would have quit playing Age of Conan years ago. Thanks, everyone. Over the course of making this video, I kinda sorta realized something. The best part about TF2 was never the game itself. I think TF2 just easily lends itself towards forming friendships, rivalries, and especially tight-knit communities. We unfortunately see a lot less of it since queuing started being a thing, but I'd argue it's still very much there. I can vouch personally that playing TF2 in a tight-knit group of people instead of just complete strangers makes it go from the least to the most fun you can have online. So next time you're on TF2, maybe give some community servers a try, like I don't know, I heard those Swishcast guys opened some casual community servers, wink, where you can play casual, you know, random crits, bullets spread off, and we have a cool selection of maps, and we host play sessions, and you can really have fun with us, and it's a nice time, but I digress. You know, that's up to you. You should also subscribe. As for Control Point, a bit of a resurgence started since I started digging up old bones. They've taken upon themselves to upload all of their episodes on YouTube for the first time, and they're releasing in the same schedule they used to release when they were coming out originally, and I think that's pretty cool. 
They've opened a Discord, but more importantly, they're also going to rock out one last time, recording one final Control Point episode with me as the guest. Dates are subject to change on when that's going live, but I'll put it up on screen as soon as it's ready, as soon as I have all the info I need. Another exciting piece of news is that I've collaborated with the hosts and original Control Point artist Boomrocker to get some 30-day limited merch out. I've also had the artist Antamilla draw up this really awesome Control Point poster. I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but uh, also all the profits will go to Palestinian relief So at the end of the month. So uh, yeah, link's gonna be in the description. Okay, no more shilling. I have one final cool thing to show you. I have decided to contribute to the Control Point fan song mania 15 years too late with my rendition of CP Jump the Shark with help from my wonderful friends Cashew Nut and Not Sam G. So let's hear it. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.